Hi, 3CN. Are you ready for chapter three? So here it is. So we know that the prince has been kidnapped by the evil Mrs. Trottle, who's not really a very nice lady at all, is she? And they've got to wait nine years, haven't they, on the island before the gump can open so they can bring him back, otherwise they can't get there. So we'll see what happens in the nine years between now and then. Chapter three. Odge Gribble was a hag. She was a very young one and a disappointment to her parents. The Gribbles lived in the north of the island and came from a long line of frightful and monstrous women who flapped and shrieked about, giving nightmares to people who had been wicked or making newts come out of their mouths of anyone who told a lie. Odge's oldest sister had a fingernail so long that you could dig the garden with it. The next girl had black hairs like piano wires coming out of her ears. The third had stripy feet and so on down to the sixth who had blue teeth and a wart the size of a saucer on her chin. Then came Odge. There was great excitement before she was born because Mrs Gribble had herself been a seventh daughter and now the new baby would be the seventh also. And the seventh daughter of a seventh daughter is supposed to be very special indeed. But when the baby came, everyone fell silent and a cousin of Mrs Gribble said, Oh dear. The baby's fingernails were short. Not one whisker grew out of her ears. Her feet were absolutely ordinary. She looks just like a small pink splodge, the cousin went on. So Mrs Gribble decided not to call her new daughter Noctulia or Valpagina and settled for Odge, which ran with splodge, and hoped that she would improve as she grew older. And up to a point, Odge did get a little more hag-like. She had unequal eyes, the left one was green and the right one was brown, and she had one blue tooth, but it was a molar and right at the back, the kind you only see when you're at the dentist. There was also a bump on one of her feet, which could just have been the beginning of an extra toe, though not a very big one. Nothing is worse than knowing you have failed your parents, but Odge did not whinge or whine. She was a strong-willed little girl with a chin like a prize fighter's, and long back hair which she drew like a curtain when she didn't want to speak to anyone and she was very independent. What she liked best was to wander along the seashore making friends with the mist makers and picking up the treasures that she found there. It was on one of these lonely walks that she came across the nurse's cave. It was a big dark cave with water dripping from the walls and the noise that came from it made Odge's blood run cold. Dreadful moans, frightful wails, shuddering sobs. She stopped to listen and after a while she heard that the whales had words to them and that there seemed to be not one wailing voice but three. Ooh, she heard. Ooh, I shall never forgive myself. Never, 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 wailed the second voice. I deserve to die, moaned a third. Look, there's Odge, look. Is that, a, that must be one of the mist makers with her, isn't it? Okay. Odge crossed the sandy bay and entered the cave. Three women were sitting there, dressed in the uniform of nursery nurses. Their hair was plastered with ashes. Their faces were smeared with mud. And as they wailed and rocked, they speared pieces of completely burnt toast from a smouldering fire and put them into their mouths. What's the matter? asked Odge. What's the matter? said the first woman. Odge could see that she had red hair beneath the ashes and a long freckled nose. What's the matter? repeated the second one, who looked so look like the first that Odge realised that she had to be her sister. How is it that you don't know about our sorrow and our guilt? said the third, and she too was so alike that Odge knew they must be triplets. Then Odge remembered who they were. The tragedy had happened before she was born, but even now the island was still in mourning. Are you the nurses who took the prince up there and allowed him to be stolen? We are, said one of the women. She turned furiously to her sister. The toast is not burnt enough, Lily. Go and burn it some more. 
Then Odge heard how they lived in the cave ever since that dreadful day, so as to punish themselves. How they only ate food that was burnt or mouldy or so stale that it hurt their teeth, and never anything they were fond of like bananas. How they never cleaned their teeth or washed, so that fleas could jump into their clothes and bite them. And they always chose the sharpest stones to sleep on, so that they woke up sore and bruised. What happened to the prince after he was stolen? asked Arge. She was more, more, much more interested in the stolen baby than in how bruised the nurses were or how disgusting their food was. He was snatched by an evil woman named Mrs Trottle and taken to her house. How do you know that? asked Arge, if the door in the gump was closed. Hags do not start school till they're eight years old, so she still had a lot to learn. There are those who can pass through the gump even when it is shut, and they told us. Ghosts, do you mean? Violet nodded. My foot feels comfortable, she grumbled. I must go and dip it in the icy water and turn my toes blue. What did she do with him, with the baby? She pretended he was her own son. He lives with her now. She's called him Raymond Trottle. Raymond Trottle, repeated Odge. It seemed an unlikely name for a prince. And he's still living there and going to school and everything. He doesn't know who he is. That's right, said Rose, poking a stick into her ear so as to try and draw blood. But in two years from now, the gump will open and the rescuers will go and bring him back. And then we will stop wailing and eating burnt toast and our feet will grow warm and the sun will shine on our face. And the queen will smile again, said Lily. Yes, that will be the best of all when the queen, sm queen smiles properly once more. Odge was very thoughtful as she made her way back along the shore, taking care not to step on the toes of the mistmakers who lay basking on the sand. The prince was only four months older than she was. How did he feel being Raymond Trotton and living in the middle of London? What would he think when he found out that he wasn't who he thought he was? And who would be chosen to bring him back? The rescuers would be famous. They would go down in history. I wish I could go, thought Odge, nudging her blue tooth with her tongue. I wish I could be a rescuer. Already she felt that she knew the prince, that she would like him for a friend. Suddenly she stopped. She set her jaw. I will go, she said aloud. I'll make them let me go. And from that day on, Odge was a girl with a mission. She started school the following year and worked so hard that she was soon top of her class. She jogged, she threw boulders around to strengthen her biceps. She studied maps of London and tried to cough up frogs. And a month before the gump was due to open, she wrote a letter to the palace. When you have worked and worked for something, it is almost impossible to believe that you can fail. Yet, when the names of the rescuers were announced, Odd Gribble's name was not among them. It was the most bitter disappointment. She would have taken it better if the people who had been chosen were mighty and splendid warriors who would ride through the gump on horseback, but they were not. A wheezing old wizard, a slightly batty fay, and a one-eyed giant who lived in the mountains moving goats about and making cheese. The head teacher, when she announced who was going in assembly, had given the reason. Cornelius the wizard has been chosen because he is wise, Gherkin Trude the Fay has been chosen because she is good, and the giant Hans has been chosen because he is strong. Of course, being the head teacher, she had then gone on to tell the children that if they wanted to do great deeds when they were older, they must themselves remember to be wise and good and strong, and they could begin by getting their homework done on time and keeping the classroom tidy. When you are a hag, it is important not to cry, but Odge, as she sat on a rock that evening, wrapped in her hair, was deeply and seriously hurt. I am wise, she said to herself. I was top again in algebra, and I'm strong. I threw a boulder right across Anchorage Bay. And as for being good, I can't see any point in that. Not for a mission which might be dangerous. And yet the letter she had written to the king and queen had been answered by a secretary who said he felt Miss Gribble was too young. Sitting alone by the edge of the sea, Odge Gribble ground her teeth. But there was another reason why those three people had been chosen. 
The king and the queen wanted their son to be brought back quietly. They didn't want to unloose a lot of strange and magical creatures on the city of London. Creatures who would do sensational tricks and be noticed. They dreaded television crews getting excited and newspaper men writing articles about a lost continent or a stolen prince. As far as the island was a lost continent, they wanted it to stay that way. And they were determined to protect their son from the kind of fuss that went on up there when anything unusual was going on. So they had chosen rescuers who could do magic if it was absolutely necessary, but could pass for human beings, well, more or less. Of course, if anything went wrong, they had hordes of powerful creatures in reserve. Winged harpies with ghastly claws, black dogs which could bay and howl over the rooftops, monsters with pale, flat eyes who could disguise themselves as rocks. All these could be sent through the tunnel if the trottles turned nasty. But no one expected this. The trottles had done a dreadful thing. They would certainly be sorry and give up the child with a good grace. Yet now... As the rescuers stood in the drawing room of the palace ready to be briefed, the king and queen did feel a pang. Cornelius was the mightiest wizard on the island, a man so learned that he could divide 23,741 by six and three quarters in the time it took a cat to sneeze. He could change the weather and strike fire from a rock, and what was most important, he had once been a university professor and lived up there, so that he could be made to look human without any trouble. Well, he was human. But they hadn't realised he was quite so old. Up in his hut in the hills, one didn't notice it so much, but in the strong light that came in from the sea, the liver spots on his bold pate did show up rather, and the yellowish streaks in his long white beard. Cor's neck wobbled as if he holding up that domed brain-filled head was too much for it. You could hear his bones creaking like old timbers every time he moved, and he was very deaf. But when they suggested that he might find the journey too much, he'd been deeply offended. To bring back the prince will be the crowning glory of my life, he said. And I'll be there to help him, Gherkin Trude had promised, looking at the old man out of her soft blue eyes. I know you will, dear, said the queen, smiling at her favourite fae. And indeed, Gherkintrude had already brought up a little patch of hair on the wizard's bold head so as to keep him warm for the journey. True, it looked more like grass because she was a sort of growth goddess, a kind of ag agricultural fairy. But the wizard had been very pleased. If the queen couldn't go, couldn't go herself to fetch back her son, and the royal advisers had forbidden it, there was no one she would rather have sent than this fruitful and loving person. Flowers sprang from the ground for Gherky, trees put out their leaves, and she never forgot the vegetables either. It was because of what she did for those rich, swollen things like marrows and pumpkins, and in particular for those delicious tiny cucumbers called gherkins, which taste so wonderful when pickled, that her name, which had been Gertrude, had gradually changed the way it had. And Gherkintrude, too, would be at home in London because her mother had been a gym mistress in a girl's school and ran about in grey shorts shouting well played and spiffing before she came to the island. Gherky had adored her mother and she sometimes talked to her plants as though they were the girls of St Agnes's school crying well grown to the raspberries or telling a lopsided tree to pull up his socks and play the game. The third rescuer was lying behind a screen being tested by the doctor. Hans was an ogre, a one-eyed giant, a most simple and kindly person who lived in the mountains putting things right for the goats, collecting feathers for his alpine hat and yodelling. As giants go, he was not very big, but anyone bigger would not have been able to get through the door of the gentleman's cloakroom. Even so, at a metre taller than an ordinary person, he would have been noticed, so it had been decided to make him visible for the journey. This was no problem. Fernseed, as everyone knows, makes people invisible in a moment, but just a few people can't take it on their skin. They come out in lumps and bumps or develop a rash, and it was to test the ogre's skin that the doctor had taken him behind the screen. Now he came out, carrying his black bag and beaming. All is well, your majesties, he said. There will be no ill effects at all. Hans followed shyly. 
The ogre always wore leather shorts with embroidered braces and they could see on his huge pink thigh a patch of pure clean, clear nothingness. But he was looking a little worried. My eye, he said. I wish not see to my eye. He spoke in short sentences with a foreign accent because his people long ago had come through a gump in the Austrian Alps. Oh, there they are. So there's Cornelius the wizard. There's Gherkin through the Fay. And there's Hans the ogre. He's got one eye. Everyone understood this. If you only have one eye, it really matters. I don't think anyone will notice a single eye floating so high in the air, said the chief advisor. And if they do, he could always shut it. So this was settled and the palace secretary handed Cornelius a map of the London Underground and a briefcase full of money. There was always plenty of that because the people who came through the gump brought it to the treasury, not having any use for it on the island. And the king now gave his orders. You know already that no magic must be used directly on the prince, he said, and the rescuers nodded. The king and queen liked ruling over a place where unusual things happened, but they themselves were completely human and could only manage if they kept magic strictly out of their private lives. As for the rest of you, I think you understand what you have to do. Make your way quietly to the trottles' house and find the so-called Raymond. If he is ready to come at once, return immediately and make your way down the tunnel. But if he needs time... How could he? cried the Queen. How could he need time? The thought that her son might not want to come to her at once hurt her so much that she had to catch her breath. Nevertheless, my dear, it may be a shock to him. And if so, he turned back to the rescuers. You have a day or two to get him used to the idea. But whatever you do, don't delay more than... He was interrupted by a knock on the door and a palace servant entered. Excuse me, your majesties, but there is someone waiting at the gates. She has been here for hours and though I've explained that you are busy, she simply will not go away. Who is it? asked the Queen. A little girl, your majesty. She has a suitcase full of sandwiches and a book and says she will wait all night if necessary. The King frowned. You'd better show her in, he said. Odge entered and bobbed a curtsy. She looked grim and determined and carried a suitcase with the words Odge Gribble, Hag, painted on the side. The Queen smiled, almost a proper smile now that she was soon to see her son. Aren't you Mrs Gribble's youngest? she said in her soft voice. Yes, I am. And what can we do for you, my dear? Your sisters are well, I trust? Odge scowled. Her sisters were very well showing off, shrieking, flapping, digging the garden with their long fingernails and generally making her feel bad. But this was no time for her own problems. I want you to let me go with the rescuers and fetch the prince, said Odge. I wrote a letter about it. The king's secretary now stepped forward and said that Miss Gribble had indeed offered her services, but he had felt that her youth made her unsuitable. The king nodded and the queen said gently, you are too young, my dear. You must see that yourself. I'm the same age as the prince, said Odge, almost, and I think it would be nice for him to have someone young. The rescuers have already been chosen, said the king. Yes, I know, but I won't take up much room, and I think I know how he might feel. Raymond Trottle, I mean. How? asked the queen eagerly. Well, a bit muddled. I mean, he thinks he's a trottle, and he thinks Mrs Trottle is his mother, and... But she isn't. She isn't. She's a wicked woman and a thief. Yes, that's true, said Odge. But if he's a royal prince, it will be difficult for him to hate his mother. And she broke off, not wanting to say more. It could be a dangerous journey, said the Queen. Odge drew herself up to her full height, which was not very great. Her green eye glinted and her brown eye glared. I am a hag, she said huffily. I am Odge with the tooth. She stepped forward and opened her mouth very wide. And the Queen could indeed see a glimmer of blue right at the back. Darkness and danger is meat and drink to hags. The King and Queen knew this to be true, but it was absurd to send such a little girl. It was out of the question. Sometimes I cough frogs, said Odge, and blushed because it wasn't true. 
Once she had coughed something that she thought might be a tadpole, but it hadn't been. Why do you want to go? asked the king. I just want to, said Odge. I want to so much that it feels that it must be meant. There was a long pause. Then the queen said, Odge, if you were allowed to go, what would you say to the prince when you first saw him? I wouldn't say anything, said Odge. I'd bring him a present. What kind of a present? asked the king. Odge told him. Hmm, chapter four. wonder what present she's going to take him. That'd be interesting. I wonder if it persuade them. Right. I shall see you for chapter four tomorrow. Bye.